Welcome once again to our to another session of our health seminar series with Dr. Nadine Plummer. This is our second to the last night, right? Um, we have two more. We have a sermon presentation tomorrow morning and a final presentation in the afternoon. Um, and that's it. We are near to the end. Um, it's a little sad, but I'm still excited because that me it still means that we have at least a few more sessions left for some imp important and precious um, uh, nuggets of information and principles we can get. I uh, would like to welcome all of you who are here in person and the sanctuary as well as for those who are joining online. Thank you for tuning in. And really, we really appreciate your presence both here in person as well as online. Before I give any other, uh, further announcements and before I introduce the speaker, I would like to invite you to bow your heads for a word of prayer. Lord, our God, we want to thank you for the wonderful week, the week full of life and blessing you have given to us. Thank you for leading us throughout the week, your guidance throughout the week, your blessings, your grace, and your love that has sheltered us throughout the week. We want to thank you once again for bringing us together here in this sanctuary as well as online for us to be part of this important health series seminar. Through this seminar for the past couple of days, we have learned that you are a God who cares for our well-being, who wishes that we be in the best health as possible. And in order for us to do that, you have provided us with important biblical and scientific principles for us to maintain and keep health. We have heard and received many information, but uh, we still have more to hear, but more, most importantly, we, have, we need the power and the strength from you for us to apply them in our lives. So Heavenly Father, as we once again dive into this um, and listen to the presentation prepared by Dr. Plummer, we pray that you would work within our, our hearts, you would speak through Dr. Plummer, so that the information, the principles she presents, we will be able to take them with our hearts and apply it in our lives so that we, your holy temples, we may be able to live a life of full health and well-being so that we may efficiently carry out your mission given to us. So once again, I'd like to pray that you especially be with Dr. Plummer, speak through her and be with her as she presents the material to us, as well as for those who are listening here in person and those who are online. We pray that we will have our hearts and our ears open as we hear from Dr. Plummer. Be with us throughout the program, and be also with us as we open the Sabbath hours. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Before I in introduce our speaker today, I'd like to present, I would like to share, once again, um, three important announcements. First, we have, after, after Dr. Plummer's presentation, we have a, a, about a 10 to 15 minute Q&A, question and answer session after her presentation. So if you have any questions that may pop up during the presentation, please save them for the Q&A session, which will be at the end of the presentation. If you have a question for those who are in the sanctuary, please come to the front, uh, to the microphone, and I'd like to um, emphasize that if you do have a question and come up to the front, please speak loudly and clearly and be close to the microphone because we have quite a number of viewers online and we don't, we don't want them to be disconnected from our program here. We want them to hear your questions as well. So please speak loudly and clearly to the microphone. The second announcement is that for those who have, who are coming in or for those who are on their way, we have a registration table that, that is prepared at the uh, entrance of our church. So please do not forget to register in the front as we want to keep a data of, uh, of the number of participants participating each night. Also for those who are joining us online, feel free to leave your name or, or your contact information to show that you are part of this series. 
And final third announcement, we have once again our blood pressure check clinic that will be opened after the Q&A session. So once the program here in the sanctuary is over, please do not head home right away. We have a clinic open right at the foyer of the church. So stop by for a few more minutes, and it's a great chance for us to check our blood pressures and get our health assessed. So at this point, I'd like to um, introduce, uh, once again, introduce to you um, our speaker for this series this week. Um, Dr. Nadine Plummer is a naturopathic doctor um, who is a graduate from the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine in Toronto. She is licensed both in British Columbia as well as in Ontario. She is a member of the Ontario Association of Naturopathic Doctors as well as the Canadian Association of Naturopathic Doctors. She is a recent author. Um, she, in fact, she has brought some of her books at the entrance of the church. So she is a recent, uh, recent author of the book entitled Authentic You. So if you're interested, you may uh, feel free to stop by the registration booth at the end to you, and you may check out her book. Um, she has a great mission and a vision through her ministry. She goes, um, she goes around give lots of presentations, particularly about um, chronic lifestyle, obesity, and through her, through her ministry, she seeks to help people change lives for the better, to be able to live a transformed life, a better life than we have lived before. And I'm sure we who have been participating uh, in this health seminar series this week, we have received important health principles that will help us to change lives, live lives that are better than the lives that we have been living so far. So at this point, I'd like to invite Dr. Plummer to share her presentation and let us give our full and undivided attention to Dr. Plummer. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor G, for that wonderful introduction. I'm actually going to start with another prayer. Uh, so let's bow our heads just for a moment. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful just for the opportunity to talk about health. I pray and ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will speak for me and that your message will go through. We say things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we are talking about sleep. Sleep. So you're going to hear the word sleep many times during this presentation. However, I'm not saying it as a suggestion. So sometimes when we hear something again and again, it just goes in naturally. This isn't a directive. So please don't sleep while we talk about sleep. So I want to start with this idea. I want to congratulate everyone who is here tonight to watch and everyone who's listening online and everybody who has been watching during this series. I want to congratulate you on any lifestyle changes that you have been making during this week. And I'll just say, congratulations, you're on the on the right road. If you are here even out of curiosity, if you are tuning in even out of curiosity, you're on the right road. Because perhaps, and my hope is, the things that you're hearing here, maybe you've heard them before and this is the, the time that you need to hear it where you're like, you know what, I'm going to try it. Or maybe you hear it now and, I don't know, a month from now, two months from now, you decide, I'm going to implement what I heard. So thank you for coming out, and thank you for listening. Sleep, well, it's something that uh, most people are thinking about all day, and sometimes it eludes us at night. It is sleep. I'm talking, my clinical focus is actually weight loss, so I often come from a weight loss perspective. People's sleep requirements vary, but generally speaking, research has observed changes in weight when people get fewer than seven hours of sleep a night. A major review found that short sleep duration increases the likelihood of obesity by 89% in children, 55% in adults. So if you're somebody who says, I've tried everything, if you're someone who's not getting enough sleep, that might be like the limiting factor for you in terms of losing weight. So it's an easy addition. 
hard and yet, let me say, simple but not easy. Many things are simple but not easy to change our sleeping habits, but it's something that could help you, especially if weight loss is one of your goals. However, sleep affects so much more than this. Sleep makes it hard not just to get to our weight loss goals, but also our exercise goals. Why? Because when we are not getting enough sleep, there's a lack of, of motivation to exercise. Have you ever found earlier in the day, you have a lot of energy and you're thinking, I would love to work out today after work. And then after you spend most of your energy uh, during the day and then you're tired at night. Could it be because you didn't get enough sleep the night before? So sleep works away at our motivation, at our drive as well. There's something else that sleep does. Poor sleep can increase your calorie intake by increasing a few things. Late night snacking. Poor sleep tends to increase our portion sizes. I remember I was actually uh, doing a weight loss uh, seminar. It was like a workshop that we did that lasted for two months. And it was in a church. We met once a week. I gave a presentation and then an assignment at the end of the week. And then everyone would come back and we'd talk about the assignment. They'd weigh in and we'd do it the next week. And uh, one week I actually had a lot to do and I didn't get enough sleep. And I got into the church early. I was really hungry. There weren't a lot of options. I'm sure this has happened to a lot of people. So I thought the only option was Subway. I always talk about not eating processed foods. And here I was, right before the presentation, about to walk into the Subway. So I thought, I'm sure there are some healthy options in Subway. I walked in, and I got a salad. That was a good choice. But afterwards, I was still hungry. So I might have gotten a vegetarian sub, and I ate that, and afterwards I was still hungry. And usually I don't eat that much, and then I saw the cookies. Okay, I didn't get one. If I weren't about to give a presentation on weight loss, I may have even gotten a cookie or two, but I had to literally pull myself out of there. But I thought it was so strange, because normally I get full, and I ate a lot, and I still wasn't full. So when I started the presentation, I realized this is because I didn't get enough sleep. And that lack of sleep was leading to me, it was affecting my portion sizes. So I can attest that a lack of sleep can affect our portion sizes. And it also throws off two hormones that kind of control our hunger and our appetite. Those hormones are ghrelin, and uh, the other hormone is leptin. Leptin is the fullness hormone, ghrelin is the hunger hormone. And our sensitivity to these two hormones are thrown off when we're not getting enough sleep. So we're not really having that sensitivity to leptin, the fullness hormone, and we end up eating more. And we're a little more sensitive to ghrelin, or you could say ghrelin, the appetite hormone. So it's like our appetite increases and there isn't an easy turn off button. And uh, poor sleep also sometimes can lead to sleeping in and then being late in the morning. And has this been anyone? I know this has been me, like, rushing out. And you don't have time to make that really beautiful, healthy breakfast or the awesome smoothie you'd planned the night before, and you end up grabbing something, something you can eat in your hand as you're driving, walking, that kind of thing, which usually ends up being who knows, like a muffin, a scone, sometimes a bagel. So this is what poor sleep does. I've often been asked this question, what really happens when we sleep? When I was a child, I thought sleep was so amazing. I was kind of fascinated with sleep, fascinated with dreams, because it was like you stopped being like your whole life stops, then you go to this other world where you can do these neat little things, and then you wake up and your life resumes. And I always wondered, what is really happening when we sleep? Well, if you've asked this question, we're going to answer it tonight. Uh, but the answer is a little more scientific than I thought it was when I was a little girl. What really happens when we sleep? 
So actually, when we sleep, we go through different stages when we sleep. I'm sure that you've heard of REM. It is a sleep stage, not necessarily the band. But I just aged myself a little bit. But REM is one of the sleep stages. And basically, when you're falling asleep, you're in this stage of sleep, which is called light sleep. You could call it stage number one. This information is from the National Sleep Foundation. There are two types of sleep. REM sleep, which accounts for about 25% of our sleep time, and non-REM sleep, which accounts for about 75% of our sleep time. REM, R-E-M, stands for rapid eye movement. Non-REM has four stages. I learned it as four stages. Now it's referred to as three stages. And it starts like this. This is where we start at the beginning of our sleep, formerly known as stage one, now N1. This is where something happens where for some people, when they're just in that, that phase between being awake and being asleep, they like, you know, their leg suddenly kicks out and they wake themselves up. It's called a hypnic, it's called a hypnic myoclonia, also called nocturnal myoclonus or better known as sleep jerks. And this is when sleep jerks occur. I'm not sure why it happens, but it could be associated with a few, thing, a few key things. Maybe excessive alcohol, maybe too much caffeine during the day, and it's like your body is awake and yet you're falling asleep. Maybe exercising too close to bedtime. It could be because of stress or it could be because of anxiety. This is the stage of light sleep when you're between being awake and falling asleep. And we're basically going through these stages. Anyone who has, you know, maybe an Apple Watch or an app that uh, tells them what's happening in their sleep would be familiar with this. Remember, I'm saying the word sleep, but don't sleep awake. So next you go into stage two, also known now as N2. This is non-REM sleep. It's a period of light, light sleep before you're about to enter and drop down into really deep sleep. Your heartbeat and your breathing slow down. Your muscles relax even further. Your body temperature drops. Eye movement then stops. Your brainwave activity slows, but then there are these bursts of electrical activity. You spend more of your repeated sleep cycle, cycle in stage two sleep than in other sleep stages because this is the stage that then drops you down into REM or you go past it and go, sorry, drops you into deep sleep or you go past it and into REM. Next is stage three. Now it's a combination of what formerly was called stages three and four. This is the period of deep sleep and this is what you need a lot of so you feel really refreshed in the morning. Here sleep is the deepest, it's the most restorative, this stage occurs in longer periods during the first half of the night. So if you're going to bed really, really, really late, then you're missing out on a little bit of this type of sleep. Your heartbeat and your breathing slow to their lowest levels during sleep. Your muscles are relaxed and it may make it difficult to awaken you. Have you ever tried to wake someone up and they're in deep sleep? I, I know people have tried to wake me up and I'm in deep sleep and they're like shaking, shaking. We went to, uh, we actually did a retreat called One Week in Paradise, a little plug here, uh, in the Muskokas. And I was sleeping in the same room as some people on my team. And I woke up to Dr. Plummer, Dr. Plummer. And someone literally was like holding my shoulder and shaking like, I don't know how I was sleeping through it, but obviously I was in a very deep sleep. And uh, I guess they had been doing this for a while, trying to wake me up. Um, I don't always go into deep sleeps like that, but I remember that thinking, aha, I was in N3. That's what was happening. <laughs> so your muscles are relaxed. This is a stage that we want, especially if you were sick or if you're in during a, a journey of healing, you want a lot of this deep restorative sleep. Your brain waves become slower, a few other things occur, your blood pressure drops. This is one of the reasons why if you have high blood pressure or a risk of high blood pressure, getting a lot of deep sleep is very important. Blood supply to the muscles increases, 
tissue growth and repairs occur, energies restored, protein regeneration occurs, muscle repair happens at this time. This is where hormones are released, like growth hormone, essential for growth. This stage is essential for growth and development, and it includes muscle development. So as you can see, it is a very important stage in sleep. And then finally, you hit REM. You spend 25% of your night in REM. First REM stage occurs about 90 minutes after you fall asleep, and it reoccurs about every 90 minutes, getting longer later in the night. What happens during this time? Your eyes begin moving rapidly from side, side to side, mostly behind closed eyelids, but I have known some people who sleep with their eyes open, and it's very, freaky to see the eyes open and the eyeballs moving. Uh, we have mixed frequency brainwave activity becomes uh, closer to that of being awake. Your breathing becomes faster and irregular. Your heart rate and blood pressure increase to near waking levels. Most of your dreaming occurs during this stage, during REM, although some can occur in non-REM sleep. At this time, your body becomes immobile and relaxed. Your muscles are turned off. Can you imagine if your muscles were turned on and you're acting out your dreams? So this way, it's like your muscles are temporarily paralyzed. It prevents you from acting out what you're experiencing when you're dreaming. Interestingly, as you age, you spend less of your time in REM sleep. This is the time where memory consolidation most likely is happening, but you need a little bit of REM and non-REM sleep. I remember when I was studying for my uh, licensing exams, I started listening to YouTube videos about um, acing the bar because I wanted to know like, what are law students doing so that they can pass the bar? What are their law professors telling them? And there was this one YouTube video that was put on by a law professor who taught bar courses, and he specifically encouraged people to study right before bed. Like have your flashcards there and just before going to bed, go through your flashcards and then go to sleep. Because he knew that this memory consolidation would be happening while they're sleeping. I don't know, I tried it, it wasn't working for me. I often fell asleep when I was going through the flashcards. So I opted to do it in the morning, but I did start listening to lectures while I was going to sleep. Not sure if it worked or not. Um, but I passed, so there you go. Uh, REM sleep's important. It provides energy to the brain and body. It supports daytime performance. So how does this actually work? We've talked about all of the stages of sleep, but how does it come together? Well, all of these stages together create what is called a sleep cycle. And basically, we go through several sleep cycles every night. As a matter of fact, it could be three to five times in one night. But with each cycle, you spend less time in the deeper stage, known as N3. So basically, I said that the deeper stage of sleep, you're spending more time of it in it earlier in the night, and you're spending more time in REM later in the night, and yet you're dropping through these cycles every 90 minutes. So an example would be something like you fall asleep, you're in stage one then you drop to stage two. Earlier in the night, you hover and spend more time here in stage three in the deep restorative sleep. Then you drop down into REM, and then you go back up into stage one. This whole thing is happening around every 90 minutes. However, later in the night, it's a little bit different. This is what they're discovering now. You start again, stage one and then you drop down into stage two. Then you drop down into stage three, and then you go into REM. You spend more time here in REM. At the end of the 90-minute cycle, you go back into stage one, and you go down to stage three, two, stage three, REM, etc. So you want to get as much of that deep restorative sleep as possible. This is one of the reasons why I always encourage people, including myself, encouraging myself, to go to bed earlier because I want to spend more time where I'm hovering there in deep sleep before I go into REM and then back up. One of the reasons why it's important to get good sleep is because sleep deprivation 
can affect us in so many different ways, ways that we might not be thinking of and ways that are very obvious. Uh, often when we're not getting enough sleep, we have trouble with thinking, trouble concentrating, your concentration, your creativity, your problem solving skills just are not as sharp when you don't get enough sleep. People are more, more prone to having accidents when they haven't gotten enough sleep uh, car accidents, falling, injuries, etc. High blood pressure. I said in one of those stages, the second stage, third stage, your blood pressure is dropping. So when people aren't getting enough sleep, especially when they're getting less than five hours of sleep a night, they're at risk for high blood pressure. And this risk for bl high blood pressure increases, of course, over time consistently five hours of sleep, which is also the time that they've found that can lead to weight gain or makes it difficult for weight loss. Memory issues, I said that during that time uh, in REM and non-REM, that's the time where memory consolidation happens. During sleep, your brain forms connections that help you process and remember new information. A lack of sleep can negatively impact both short-term memory and long-term memory. Mood changes. How many people here are in joyous and cheerful moods when they don't get enough sleep? I was thinking maybe there'd be an anomaly and someone's like, me, I'm always happy when I don't get enough sleep. I think a lot of us have experienced this. If we don't get enough sleep, the next day you don't have as much, maybe not as much patience, or you feel more, more easily irritated. Uh, sleep deprivation can make you moody emotional, quick-tempered. Chronic sleep deprivation can affect your mood and lead to anxiety or depression, which then may escalate. Weakened immunity. Too little sleep weakens your immune system, uh, weakens our defenses against viruses like those that cause the common cold and the flu. You're more likely to get sick when you're then exposed to the germs because of poor sleep. Weight gain, as I started this presentation off with, with sleep deprivation, the chemicals that signal to your brain that you're full are off balance, and that's mainly that chemical leptin. As a result, you're more likely to overindulge when you have uh, not had enough sleep, and when you've had enough to eat, you're overindulging. You just don't really get that turn it off signal, or you're not listening. Risk of heart disease, Sleep deprivation may lead to an increased blood pressure, higher levels of chemicals linked to inflammation, both of which play roles in heart disease. Poor balance, as I said, sleep deprivation could lead to accidents. It can also lead to fall. It can affect, this lack of sleep can affect our coordination, and then you're more prone to having accidents. Uh, risk for diabetes. A lack of sleep affects your body's release of insulin, a blood sugar lowering hormone. People who don't get enough sleep have a higher blood sugar levels and therefore an increased risk for type two diabetes. And finally, low sex drive. People who don't get enough sleep often also have a lower libido. In men, this decreased sex drive may be due to a drop in testosterone levels. And there is more than just the few things that I have uh, mentioned here. It's pretty incredible how much sleep affects us. So what is the key? What is kind of the trick for poor sleep? I'm gonna suggest that one of the ways for us to get better sleep is just in something as simple as the, the blink of an eye. The blink of an eye. I'll leave that there as a mystery that we'll find out about in a moment. Other benefits of sleep. It's a teaser, the blink of an eye. There's a great removal of waste products from the brain cells when we're sleeping. Basically, when you're sleeping, your brain goes through, like you could call it a brain car wash. Why is sleep important? The lymphatic system causes the release of cerebral spinal fluid. That is the fluid that's around the, the brain and also around the spinal cord. It bas basically washes out all the debris from the brain. I call it a brain car wash. So if you want a really good brain car wash, you have to spend more time sleeping. 
Adequate amounts of sleep, this is according to Johns Hopkins, especially deep sleep can decrease dementia risk. According to Johns Hopkins research, sleep deprivation puts you at a 33% increased risk for dementia. Now that's a good reason to get high quality sleep. Adequate amounts of sleep can aid in maintaining healthy blood pressure and blood sugar levels, as we already said. According to Johns, Johns Hopkins, those who are sleep deprived are more likely to have high blood pressure, diabetes, and narrowed blood vessels. Adequate amounts of sleep, uh, quality sleep can contribute to happiness, makes sense, and a better memory. With sleep deprivation, there's a greater risk of depression, irritability, anxiety, and forgetfulness. And of course, when we get high quality sleep, then often people don't, go, don't get as sick as they would have. Adequate quality sleep contributes to a stronger immune system. With sleep deprivation, there are fewer active immunity protectors. They're called natural killer cells you're three times more likely to catch a cold. Okay, I said the secret to high quality sleep is in the blink of an eye. I'm kind of curious. I want to know if anybody can guess uh, what I mean by that. I'm just, uh, I'll repeat what you say for the people online. Anyone? The blink of an eye. Okay, I'll explain it. So basically, the blink of an eye, if you look at this eye, which is looking at the light, it's all about setting your sleep schedule and setting your body's physiological clock, also known as your circadian rhythm. And what you do in the morning sets kind of the rhythm for your body so you can sleep better at night. So when you, go, when you wake up in the morning, going outside first thing in the morning and exposing your eye to light is going to set your physiological clock or your circadian rhythm for the entire day. This causes the release of certain chemicals, certain neurotransmitters that help you to stay awake during the day and fall asleep at night. This is what I mean by the blink of an eye. So how does it work? We have a physiological clock, also known as our circadian rhythm. It is like your body's 24-hour clock. It regulates when certain hormones or certain chemicals are released. This affects things like our mood, how sleepy or awake we feel, our energy levels, and our cognitive function. The major hormones include serotonin and melatonin. This is a very um, general look at the physiological clock. So it may not be, you know, 100% scientifically accurate, but it gives you an idea that certain things are happening in your body with certain chemicals being secreted at certain times. So let's say you wake up around 6 o'clock. Melatonin is a hormone that's secreted by the pineal gland that helps you to more to fall asleep but it also helps to better, uh, have better sleep quality. So we wake up. If you look at the light right away, melatonin secretion will be stopped like that. Shortly after waking up, melatonin secretion stopping. Testosterone level starts to go up. Cortisol, which is the hormone that we talked about on our stress night. Cortisol is a stress hormone, but it's also like an energy hormone. It helps us to be alert. So cortisol goes up in the morning. This is all happening if you're not a night worker. This is if you're somebody who works during the day. For people who do night shifts, it's a little bit the opposite, and yet it's like your physiological clock gets a little confused, especially if you switch back and forth between days and nights. But that's another discussion. If we have enough time at the end, we'll talk about how it works for people who are doing night shifts. But basically, in the morning, cortisol goes up. That's what you want. You want cortisol to go up high in the morning. You want it to come down at night. People who have insomnia often have the opposite. They're a little sleepy in the morning, but cortisol goes up at night. And suddenly, they get what's called the second wind, and then the third wind, and the fourth wind. And they become very active in the evening and at nighttime. That means their cortisol level's high. When you go outside in the morning and you look at the light, 
And this actually, according to Dr. Andrew Huberman, who is a neuroscientist from Stanford University, he really encourages people for setting the clock. He also works on stress and ophthalmology. Um, going outside, just getting some sunshine for 20 to 30 minutes in the morning, uh, that really helps to bring the cortisol levels down at night, and then you're able to sleep better. Also, earlier in the day, testosterone levels are going higher, so that's the time to really do that big thing, whatever it is, that big project at work, the hardest thing for the day, don't put it off until later. Do it when you have the cortisol and you have the testosterone helping you. We're very alert, usually in the morning, and then coordination gets better as we go through the day. As we're moving into bedtime, your body starts ramping up the melatonin, and this is why you get tired and this melatonin secretion starts about two hours before your normal bedtime, and then it kind of peaks and it helps you to fall asleep. So that's your body's physiological clock. Light is the thing that plays the major role in the synchronization of that clock. And your clock is actually synchronized not just to the day, but to the seasons as well, and to the regulation of your sleep. So where and when light environments are irregular, we can experience issues in things in like our mood and our sleep. Problems within this rhythm, this physiological clock known as the circadian rhythm, can even cause, can even be as impactful as causing learning deficits. That's how important sleep is. I hope everyone is intending on going to bed early tonight. After this, including myself, one of the key players is melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone which causes drowsiness and it lowers your body temperature. This is one of the reasons why people tend to sleep a little bit better in a cooler room. So basically, this is how it happens, and I'll explain this just in a snapshot. The release of melatonin involves the retina. The retina, which is in the back of the eye, detects light. So when you go outside in the morning, the light is detected by the retina. The retina then sends a signal up. That light is changed into a photon energy, which is then changed into a signal. And that signal is then sent up to an area in the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's in the midbrain, and it's kind of like the pacemaker that is in our brain, and like a pacemaker that you would have in your heart. That suprachiasmatic nucleus sends a signal up to the pineal gland, which is located in the epithalamus, the pineal gland gets the signal and basically interprets all of this to mean it is either daytime, so cut off melatonin, or if it's dark, it gets the signal and it interprets it to mean it's nighttime, so increase the melatonin. It's all about the light hitting the retina, as simple as that. This always makes me think of that biblical verse that says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen? So the suprachiasmatic nucleus, it's in the hypothalamus right above the optic chasm. Uh, the hormones that play a role in generating regular sleep cycles, but also many different body functions that are happening in our 24 hours are kind of regulated by that area. You could call it the circadian pacemaker. It uses melatonin levels as a signal regarding the time of day. As I said, melatonin secretion is happening throughout the day. Highest at bedtime starts ramping up two hours before bed. The schedule of melatonin secretion is based solely on the light hitting the retina. So if you're someone who, let's say you normally go to bed at 10.30, 10.30 on the dot, you're in bed and you have a slow sleep onset, or a, a fast sleep onset, meaning you go to bed, you fall asleep within 15 to 20 minutes. And then you're invited out to a wedding. Your normal bedtime is at 10.30. You're invited to a wedding. And at the wedding, they serve the dinner very late, 9 o'clock, 9.30. After that, everybody gets on the dance floor and everyone starts dancing at 10.30. If you are the person who is sitting at your table and you're really struggling to stay awake and you're like this and nodding off, I would say that's actually a good sign. 
I'm not encouraging people to sleep at weddings. But it means that your body's clock is set, meaning that your melatonin secretion probably start at 8.30, you're hitting the peak at around 10.30, and your body is that sensitive that is encouraging you to go to sleep because the dosing of melatonin in your body is so high at that time. So I wouldn't take that as a bad sign. It's a good sign. It means you're synchronized. If you're someone who can stay up and sometimes you're sleeping, sometimes you're not, sometimes you're awake, sometimes you aren't, then your body's physiological clock is not synchronized and on schedule. Uh, and a clock that moves on schedule and is on schedule works a little bit better. So as I said, melatonin secreted by the pineal gland. It is known as the darkness hormone. It is inhibited by light. That's actually the sun, but it looks a bit like the retina. So I put it in. And your brain doesn't know, is it daytime or is it nighttime? The brain can't see. Well, actually, the eyeballs are an extension, an outer extension of the brain. And there's what there are, they are what is telling the brain. It's nighttime. It's daytime. There are certain things that we are doing now that tell the brain it's daytime when it isn't. And one of them is this, which I'll tell you about near the end. We have another hormone that's secreted that's kind of like the twin for melatonin. It's called serotonin. Serotonin has an intriguing relationship with melatonin. It's like the opposite twin. Melatonin makes us sleepy. It increases with darkness. Serotonin makes us awake. It increases with light and sunshine. So going out first thing in the morning can help to cut off the melatonin and bump up the serotonin. The importance of sunlight first thing in the morning, even if it is a cloudy day, you could still go out and look at the light. Your body and mind will reset for the day, setting the circadian rhythm for the day based on light. If you spend 20 to 30 minutes outside, as soon as you wake up, I actually go outside in my pajamas so I can get that light, you'll sleep better at night. I'd recommend that you change your pajamas after that. But if you're up at sunrise, so you spend a little bit of time looking at the sunrise. You could also practice gratitude at that time for the day. The most important things for sleep are two things. What you do as soon as you wake up and what you do about 90 minutes before you go to bed. So if sleep is an issue for you, looking at those two times and what you can change in those two times, what you do when you wake up, and that would be get outside and get some light, and we'll talk about what to do 90 minutes before bed. Simply changing these two things uh, will most likely help you to see a drastic change in your sleep quality. Morning exercisers spend more time in the deepest stage of sleep. Hence, people who exercise in the morning are producing more human growth hormone while they're sleeping. This is according to the Appalachian State University sleep study. People who exercise in the morning have more efficient sleep cycles, they sleep longer, and they have a greater drop in blood pressure at night. You only need to do five minutes in the morning. Five minutes in the morning. That was found to outperform traditional cardio. Why does it work? Because it triggers a cortisol reset. Cortisol is like that energy hormone. People who have issues sleeping normally have high cortisol at night, low cortisol in the morning. Doing that exercise in the morning causes the inverse. And I remember hearing someone being uh, interviewed in a podcast on the Appalachian State University sleep study, and I couldn't believe that they only did five minutes of exercise. I was thinking, you know, you go for a 45-minute walk, five minutes of exercise, and it was more like old-fashioned calisthenics, like they're doing squats, burpees, lunges, planks for five minutes, and that's it. And that caused a cortisol reset. So it's easy, but it also takes, you know, it's a matter of consistency. And consistency is something we've been talking about all week long. Some of these ideas are simple and easy to implement for a short period of time, but you really get the benefit when you are consistent 
over time. Okay, times. The best time to sleep. Note, sleep between 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. affects dopamine levels beneficially for the day to come. And we talked earlier, I think nearly every night, we've talked a little bit about dopamine levels. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that causes us to have a sense of pleasure, happiness, reward. So when you're going to sleep a little bit earlier, 10 p.m., uh, that sleep, during that time, you're going to spend more time in restorative sleep. Um, you will have more dopamine or you could feel more joy, more pleasure the next day. Another reason to go to bed at 10 p.m. If you're going to bed at 10 p.m., usually in the first four hours, let's say between 10 and 2, these are all approximates. Between 10 and 2, that's the time where you're spending more time in deep restorative sleep. 2 to 6 or so, so you're spending time in deep sleep, but then you're moving and spending more time in REM. So getting a great combination of both would be optimal. Uh, today's presentation is short. I'm going to end with the sleep, uh, sleep recommendations but also with a brief explanation as to why these are the sleep recommendations. And if you've been listening, you can probably figure out why they are the sleep recommendations as well. Number one, sleep in a fully dark room. Okay, if this were a class, I would ask everybody to answer why is number one important. So I might as well just ask one person, why is sleeping in a fully dark room important? Perfect. Melatonin needs darkness. Okay, so for the online people, I won't keep asking the questions. But yes, sleep in a fully dark room because melatonin secretion is based depending on light. So if the room is fully dark, you will have more melatonin secretion. Even if you have a little bit of light on, or if you have one of those uh, old-fashioned uh, clock radios with the, the light on, um, even that little bit of light, that's how sensitive the, the retina and the signal is. That little bit of light will affect the dosing of melatonin. So the darker the room equals the more melatonin. It doesn't mean that you can't sleep in a room with like a night light or the doors open and the light in the hallways there or you, you don't have blinds. Most people can still sleep it just means you're not getting the amount of melatonin that you could. And if sleep is an issue for you, then probably sleep onset's an issue because you're not getting enough melatonin. Melatonin has many other benefits as well, not just for sleep. They've done studies on melatonin and cancer prevention and its anti-cancer or anti-tumor effect. So there are so many more benefits to melatonin than just sleep. So you want a very powerful dosing of melatonin every night. Number two, always go to sleep and wake up at the same time. So tempted to ask, but I will explain. You always want to go to sleep and wake up at the same time because you are the one who's setting your body's physiological clock. We have a natural physiological clock, and we have the physiological clock that we set ourselves. So when you're consistent in your sleep-wake time, like the person who goes to the wedding and falls asleep there, that means they're consistent, you're setting the clock. And when you're setting that clock, then you're also setting the start of the release of the chemicals and the ending of it too. You want the right chemicals to be released or the right hormones at the right time. So you want cortisol to work for you, so it gives you energy during the morning and day, and to work for you so it's going down at night instead of against you and then you're awake at night and you can't fall asleep. Do not drink liquids within four hours of bedtime. Hopefully this makes sense now. Usually for most people, there are some people this doesn't happen, but when they're drinking liquids within four hours of bedtime, meaning they're filling their bladder with liquids and then they're going to bed, they can't hold it, especially if they're getting eight hours of sleep. 
seven to eight hours, which is optimal. They can't hold it for the whole night. And then they wake up and they go to the bathroom. And for some people, they're waking to go to the bathroom two times or three times over the night. But they think it doesn't really matter because they quickly fall back asleep. However, now that we know that you go through cycles of sleep, you always go back to stage one. Then you have to go to stage two. Then you're dropping down into stage three, formerly three, four, deep sleep. And then you go into REM. And if you're going through these stages and your body's saying, wake up, wake up, uh, to stop you from, you know, wetting the bed like a child, then um, when you go back to sleep, you don't drop back down into stage three. You have to go back into stage one, stage two, stage three, three, four, and then into REM. Oh, I need to go to the bathroom again. Go to the bathroom, you're back to stage one. So every time you're waking up to go to the bathroom or you're waking up in the middle of the night, you're disrupting sleep. And most people think that it doesn't matter, but imagine if that's happening many times throughout the night, and then you're missing out on that time in the deep sleep, or you're missing out in the time in REM sleep, and your body automatically switches to, okay, now I'm spending more time in REM from deep sleep. You can't go back in time to, oh, it doesn't matter, I'll catch up on my deep sleep. No, you're working with a cycle. So this is one of the reasons why it's important not to wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. And most people will find if they don't drink liquids or even eat within four hours of bedtime, then they sleep through the night. Um, number four, sleep in a clean room. Turn the thermostat slightly down before bed. Turn the thermostat slightly down before bed, not too far, because if you're too cold, I think many of us have experienced this, it's hard to fall asleep. You're just too aware of the temperature. But melatonin causes your body temperature to drop a little bit, so we tend to sleep better when the room is slightly cooler. Sleep in a clean room because our brains get accustomed to routine. And I've heard the saying, messy room, active mind sort of thing. So you don't want your brain like looking at all the things, oh, I have to put away those pants and I should clean that up and tidy up those books, etc. You don't want the brain to be too active right before bed. Exercise regularly, but not too soon before bed. As we saw in the Appalachian Sleep Study, they exercised as soon as they woke up for five minutes. That set the cortisol rhythm for the day. Exercising too soon before bed causes the release of cortisol, adrenaline, and then you're awake. Uh, so you want to be sleepy at bedtime. The bedroom should only be used for two things. Number one, sleeping. Number two, intimacy. And basically, I'm saying your bedroom should not also be your gym. So some people have uh, an elliptical or a, they might have a treadmill in their bedroom. Uh, for some people, their bedroom is also their office. For some people, they're doing podcasts. Their bedroom is their podcast video room. And it's also where they sleep. So when it's sleep time, it makes sense that suddenly you're finding it hard to fall asleep. Your brain doesn't know, are we going to exercise now? No, we're making a podcast. So you only want to do two things in the bedroom, sleeping and intimacy. No electronics or blue lights within one hour before bed. So I said that this little device is the thing that causes a lot of confusion in the brain. No electronics or blue lights within one hour before bed. The electronics and the blue lights, meaning that this device, this device is giving off a light. And that light, it looks like it's white, but it's actually the, the true color of the light is blue. And our eyes see that light as though it is daylight, something similar, and it cuts off the secretion of melatonin. And that makes it harder for us to fall asleep. For some people, they eventually do fall asleep looking at their phone, but they're elongating that time where they would be falling asleep because they're stopping that higher dosing of melatonin. There are a few things that you can use if you wanted to still look at your phone, not that I encourage this, or you want to still be on your computer or your iPad, uh, you could get glasses that help to block the light. 
You can use filters on your phone, like a night filter on your phone, so it's more of a red hue, so you can keep looking at your phone and it won't affect the melatonin secretion in the same way. If you're doing that, you're still doing something that's active. And your brain, at, at least with you know things on our phone, our computers, we get very engaged. So maybe it's not affecting melatonin secretion, but you're still engaging the brain and stimulating the brain. If melatonin becomes overpowering, then you would fall asleep doing that thing. Uh, but why not put things away so that your brain can be in a nice, relaxed state, so your nervous system could be in a parasympathetic state, meaning a nice, calm state before bed. Avoid caffeine, avoid alcohol, avoid nicotine which all interfere with sleep. Alcohol suppresses REM sleep, which is associated with memory consolidation and emotional well-being. Alcohol increases snoring. Maybe it won't affect your sleep, but it might affect your wife's sleep or your husband's sleep. So we want to avoid that. Get outside, as I said, for 30 minutes in the morning. It can help you sleep at night. No napping, 30 minutes if absolutely needed because you don't want to sleep too much during the day and then not be tired at night. Establish a de-stressing and calming pre-bedtime routine. Okay, this is the time where I'm going to talk about just a few things that can help with sleep. So establish a de-stressing and calming pre-bedtime routine. So you want that routine, whatever it is, especially if you're someone who finds it hard to sleep, to be a routine that encourages the nervous system to get out of fight or flight, which is the sympathetic nervous system, and get to get into rest and digest, which is the parasympathetic nervous system. You also want your brain to keep secreting the melatonin. So the first thing you could do is change the lighting. Lighting from overhead, which is the sun is overhead, the lights are overhead, and this is not according to me. Again, this is according to Dr. Andrew Huberman. The overhead light is the light that's more effective in, uh, in cutting off the melatonin secretion. So you want to change your lighting so you have low lights and change your lighting so it's dim lighting. So part of your pre-bedtime de-stressing routine might be I put on lamps. I turn off all the, all the lights and I put on low light and lamps. And that's sending this signal to my body that it's time to get ready for bed. People have found that taking nice warm baths before bed tends to also relax the body, helps to switch you into more of a parasympathetic state, which is what you want. So for some people, taking a nice bath before bed can also help with sleep. Sometimes using essential oils or the smell of certain essential oils like lavender can also help with sleep. Lavender is a natural anxiolytic, which I think we showed last night or the night before. Oh, for the cognitive function. Um, lavender is a natural anxiolytic, meaning it's an anti-anxiety flower. So it helps to uh, move the brain out of an anxious state and more into a rested state, and so it helps with sleep. So you could take a little bit of lavender, either sprinkle it on the pillow, you could put it in your bath water, you could take a little bit, rub it on your temples, and that might help with sleep. Or if you had a diffuser, you could put a little bit of lavender in the diffuser and then turn the, the diffuser on as part of your pre-bedtime routine, meaning you change the lighting, put the diffuser on. When you go to walk in that room, the whole room smells like a lavender field. So nice to sleep in a lavender field if you had a nice cushy mattress as well. So that's kind of like what you're turning your bed into. And the more you smell it, it's through the olfactory nerve that, that lavender has the effect, then the more relaxed you will be. These are all part of a calming pre-bedtime routine. For some people, they might include prayer. Uh, they might include kind of offloading what happened during the day. So you're praying to the Lord and you're saying, this happened, that happened, that happened. And then you can release it and go to bed. For some people, they might do a little bit of journaling before bed. And you could also journal about the things you're grateful for because gratitude causes the release of those bliss and feel-good hormones. Whatever it is for you, 
And usually part of a pre-bedtime routine also includes things like flossing your teeth, brushing, brushing your teeth after you floss, uh, maybe putting on moisturizer. Whatever your pre-bedtime routine is, even if you want to include some of those things, uh, if, it's, if you wanted your muscles to relax, you might take a little bit of castor oil, combine it with a little bit of lavender oil, put those together, rub that on your legs, rub it on your arms before you go to bed. That might help you to sleep and relax as well. The most important thing is whatever you're doing, that you do it consistently. So it becomes part of your pre-bedtime routine. Your brain knows, okay, we're getting ready for bed, and then it's very easy for you to fall asleep. We're going to end with uh, two Bible verses. Uh, first of all, with a suggestion, something to make it easier to help you remember. And the word is seer. The S is sleep. The E is exercise. Remember, you're exercising in the morning, not at night, maybe only five minutes. The next E is education. So we got some education here tonight, especially on the effects of melatonin and light. And the R is reflection. So you could reflect on the things that you might be doing based on the 10 things we just talked about that are affecting your sleep that you maybe didn't even know about. Maybe you're drinking right before bed, waking up twice in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, and you didn't realize that that is affecting your sleep. Maybe you're using your phone right before bed, and you didn't realize that that was affecting your sleep. Or maybe you're sleeping and there are lights in the room, and you're, then you're tired the next day, and you didn't realize that was affecting your sleep. So the R is for reflect. Reflect on what you're doing that might be affecting your sleep now that you have the E, education, and make sure you E, exercise in the morning, and then you'll get the S, much better sleep. So let's end with two Bible verses that I think are quite important when we're talking about sleep. The first one is Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It's a Bible verse that I find encouraging when talking about sleep. This Bible verse says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Okay, how could this apply to sleep? I would suggest that cheating on sleep is a behavior and a custom that's very popular in the world. People brag about, oh, you know what, I pulled an all-nighter, and then I did an amazing job with that project or that exam. You know, I did this. I only had two hours sleep. Can you believe it? So don't copy that behavior of the world. Instead, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think, even changing the way you think about sleep, even changing the way you think about your body, and by changing the way you think about health. Second Bible verse is from, oops, I hope this stays. Ooh, let's try it again. The second Bible verse is from Philippians chapter 4. Why this Bible verse? Philippians 4 verse 6. Because one of the reasons why people often experience insomnia is because they're anxious at bedtime. At bedtime, there are very few distractions. Maybe during the day, there might be something that's bothering you, but you're distracted, you're doing things, you're moving. At bedtime, you're still, and it's you and your thoughts, basically. And that's the time where all of the anxieties and the worries come, and it could be about past, present, future, you know, five years from now, something that happened that day. And so I like this Bible verse, especially when it comes to having a better sleep. Be anxious for nothing. So if you're someone who gets anxious right at the time you're trying to fall asleep, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. And peace, isn't that exactly what we need right before we fall asleep? So I would suggest that you try this. If falling asleep is difficult, you could try praying at the end of the day when you're lying in bed, saying a prayer and telling God you're thankful for certain things, 
You're requesting certain things, and this Bible verse actually promises he'll give you peace. Amen? So that's it for our presentation on sleep. As Pastor G said, we have maybe 10 minutes for questions. So if anyone has any questions, could you please come up to the front, and you can ask the questions at the red mic. Testing. Thank you, Dr. Plummer, for the presentation. I'd just like to address uh, quite a number of questions from our viewers online. Okay. So I will be reading those questions. Question number one, uh, hormonal changes due to menopause affects mm. sleep quality. What can help? Yes. This is a, a heavy question or loaded question because there's so many things that happen during menopause that affect sleep. It's not just the hormonal changes can cause night sweats, they can cause fluctuations in temperature and often, and they can also cause anxiety. So sleep is heavily affected. Often people aren't sleeping for all of those reasons. Because of anxiety or just thinking a lot, they find it hard to sleep. And they might also find it hard to sleep because they're having night sweats, so they're very hot, and then they throw the covers off, and then they're a little bit soaked, and then they're too cold, you put the covers on and you're going back and forth. So there are a few answers um, based on those two things. So it's more about the way that those hormonal changes affect the body and the way that's affecting the sleep. For anxiety, using something like lavender, as I'd said, and this isn't a recommendation. Uh, this is just, you can look up the studies. Using something like lavender, using it in the diffuser before bedtime, that's something that can help with that type of anxiety, so it helps you to fall asleep. But then after you fall asleep, sometimes in the middle of the night, that's when people will get night sweats. And there are certain teas that can also help with night sweats or menopausal uh, symptoms, like sage tea, that's something you'd have to take during the day, so you're drinking sage tea during the day. It can help with hot flashes, helps with night sweats at night. But of course, you're not drinking that tea within about three or four hours of bedtime because you don't want to have to wake up to use the bathroom and then you have uninterrupted sleep. So uh, I often use these two things. That, and I encourage that person to exercise in the morning. They're using up a lot of their energy. That's going to help to set their cortisol as well. That was a, a long answer, but it's involved when it comes to sleep and menopause. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, two more questions. Question number two, how effective is melatonin supplements? Mm. That's the second question. And the third question would be, how do you regulate your circadian rhythm when you are working either shift work or late shifts that yeah. go into 1 to 2 a.m.? So that last one's a tough one. But uh, you were saying, does melatonin work? Sorry, what was the second question about melatonin? How effective is melatonin? How, how effective is melatonin supplements? Right. So it's interesting, I would say, that God's given us our own pharmacy. That's, and the fact that we actually secrete melatonin is amazing. Uh, so before taking a supplement, you might want to do all of the things we talked about that increase the dosing of melatonin. But if that's not working and you choose for an exogenous source of melatonin, like a supplement, it varies. I have found that melatonin is very effective for some people, not effective for other people. And it also depends. Are you getting a, a melatonin supplement of 3 milligrams or are you using melatonin of 5 milligrams, 10 milligrams? The interesting thing is for sleep, you really don't need those high doses. You can over, you can take too much melatonin and not get the effect. We usually prescribe about three milligrams of melatonin only. The other thing is melatonin can help with sleep quality, sleep onset, but not necessarily help you to stay asleep. So melatonin is more something that helps with people who are finding it difficult to sleep. They're like thinking a lot at bedtime or for various reasons, just not falling asleep. So if you're someone who has, uh, doesn't have difficulty falling asleep, 
but then you wake up in the middle of the night not to go to the bathroom, uh, then maybe melatonin won't be the sleep supplement for you. There are other things that are more effective for that. So that's one of the reasons why people might say melatonin is not working, because they actually don't need melatonin to fall asleep. The other thing is melatonin has a little bit of window for its like optimal efficacy, which is within 30 minutes. So sometimes if people are taking the right dosing, but they make themselves stay awake, like they take the melatonin and yet they're staying up, even if they're getting a little bit sleepy, they will miss the melatonin window, if you want to call it that, the melatonin window. So then an hour later, they've been like making themselves stay awake, usually by being on the phone or being exposed to light, and then they can't fall asleep and they say it wasn't working. So if you use melatonin correctly for the right reason and the right dosing, usually it can be pretty effective. But if any of those other factors are there, it might not be as effective. Uh, the second question was about shift workers. And that's, that is, a, a, I would say, delicate question. And it's also a question that depends. If this is a shift worker who consistently has the same shift, it's one thing. If it's someone who goes back and forth, day shift, night shift, day shift, night shift, that's uh, challenging. And usually using a supplement to help your body to adjust uh, is what can help, but you really don't have enough time there to set the physiological clock so things are working. Just when things are working in a way, um, just when things are working in a way uh, that where the clock is set, then you're shifting it again. But if you happen to be a shift worker who consistently has the same shifts, and your shift goes right until 2 o'clock in the morning, and it's always the same, then I would work with the general principle of counting hours and going to bed at the same time. So let's say you, this is, this is not prescriptive, just letting you know. So if this is you, this is just a suggestion on how you might do it. You finish work at 2 o'clock. The other thing is your eating times come into this as well, your fasting time comes into it as well, so you're kind of rejigging everything because you don't want to be eating right before you go to bed, you don't want to be drinking before you go to bed, and you want to exercise earlier. But let's say you finish work at 2 a.m. At 2 a.m., that's normally the time where your body is slowly making that shift, not to use that word too much, into uh, moving from hovering more in deep sleep to spending more time in REM. So you want to get to bed as quickly as possible. A lot of people come home at 2 or 1 o'clock, and they're kind of up, and they think, I'm already up. This is a great time to finish this, 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 and send out these emails and use my telephone, and you're doing all these things that are making it hard for you to fall asleep. And that's really hard because you've come back from work, and most people have a little bit of wind down time. So as you can see, this is going to be a long answer. But I'll try to shorten it. Most people have some wind down time. You want to cut that time down. So you're getting to bed as quickly as possible. If you start establishing your pre-bedtime routine from there. You come home, you change into your pajamas, you do your basic hygiene, turn the lights off, don't go on your phone or on your computer, and you start maybe using something like, let's say, the uh, lavender essential oil or the diffuser. Get that going so your brain is beginning to shift out of the sympathetic nervous system state, which is fight or flight. That's like stress, stress, stress. I just finished work. You want to help your brain to move into parasympathetic as quickly as possible. So eliminate doing all of the activities that would cause more alertness and start doing activities that put your brain more into a chilled state. You could even get into the practice of, I get home, I start a warm bath, I put a little bit of lavender essential oil in the bath, I take a bath, this helps me relax, now my brain is shifting, then I put on my pajamas, I change all the lighting, 
I go to bed. I force myself not to do any extra laundry, housework, anything, and I go to bed at that time. Then your goal would be, I want to sleep for about seven hours. If going to bed at that time is not working, and you're awake, this is where you might use that three milligrams of melatonin. You might try it at that time, but also do the lavender, do the warm bath. You want to kind of push your body into sleep, just at the beginning. Afterwards, your body's going to be in that cycle already. And then you'd go to sleep, and you're sleeping for about seven to eight hours. So hopefully, if you're getting home at 2 a.m. at the latest, you're in bed by 2.45, this means that it's quarter to three, and then you're waking up at quarter to 10 or quarter to 11. I don't know what time this person's leaving for work, but the first thing you want to do on waking, get out of bed, even if you're tired, go straight outside, look at the sun, and get the sunlight hitting the retina. Even spend 20 to 30 minutes instead of just a quick moment outside. 20, you could take some warm water and sip it while you're outside so it could trigger a bowel movement as well because everything gets thrown off here. 20 to 30 minutes looking at the sun and that's going to be the big thing. What you do when you come home, what you do when you wake up. So now it's around 11 a.m. You're setting the cortisol level for the day. After that, do five minutes of exercise. And after that, you basically want to eat Maybe every four hours you're eating your lunch, your breakfast, your lunch, your dinner, and make sure your lunch is the biggest meal, your dinner is the lightest meal. Don't snack between le meals. Leave that space of about four hours. And, and I would do it something like that. Use that pre-bedtime routine to shift you into the tired state. Avoid doing extra activities and use the sunlight to wake you up and exercise to set the cortisol. I hope that made sense. That's, that's probably how I would do it. And then the only thing with that would be consistency. Because now you're the one setting your physiological clock. So it's a little counter to the way nature designed us. So you want to consistently keep doing that. And, and then your rhythm will be set. Uh, I think we might have time for one more question. This would be our last question of the evening, and then we'll move to, uh, into the area where we're taking blood pressure and doing blood pressure checks. Go ahead. Oh, oh I, I did want to ask uh, if, if we can reset that uh, circadian rhythm, and apparently you have, you, have, you have said it, that you can do it. And it will, it will, but will it be as effective as going to bed at 10 o'clock? Or is it not as effective as, as going to bed at 10 o'clock? That's mm -hmm. the one, one thing I'm wondering. If, if we can be consistently going to bed instead of 10 o'clock, we go to bed at 12 o'clock and get up later. Is, right. it, is it as effective as, as going to bed at 10? <laughs> and next thing is, yeah. I have a clock with a green light rather okay. than a r blue light. Right, right. Uh, and there's also one with a red light okay. instead of a blue light. I, right. Is it still okay <laughs> to have it in the room? <laughs> well, the, the light, actually the color of the light does play a factor, but you're, you're, uh, the retina is still seeing the light. I mean, it's just like one light is better than another, but no light is the best. So instead of the blue light, yes, we're a little more sensitive to blue light. That's why we have red light filters for our phone, but it's still having an effect, just not as much. So no light is better. Uh, your other question, instead of going to bed at 10 p.m., you're going to bed every night at 12 a.m., let's say, 11.59 p.m. or so. Uh, are you setting your circadian rhythm um, that way. You are, however, we were kind of naturally made, as I said, to spend more time in that deep restorative sleep earlier in the night. So if you're going to bed just a little bit past that time, you're probably getting a little bit less of the deep sleep. I can't say exactly because, like for a shift worker, 
I know that you're setting your circadian rhythm and the clock for the other chemicals throughout the day, but I'm just not sure, or I don't know in particular, if you're still getting the same amount of the deep restorative sleep. Part two, Thank go you. ahead. Um, nurses and other uh, yes. shift workers, or, or so, sorry, I should say, it, do do they have do do they get certain diseases like cancer more than the rest of the population? They do, yeah. They have done studies on nurses and uh, mostly nurses who are doing shift worker, and they found that breast cancer is the breast cancer risk is much higher. And uh, I think just my deductive reasoning could be it's because they're not receiving the same amount of natural melatonin, and melatonin is a natural anti-tumor and anti-cancer compound. So they have done studies on breast cancer and shift workers and found that there's a correlation. I don't think it's necessarily causation, but they found a correlation. Um, okay, this will be the last, last, last question. Go ahead. Restless leg syndrome. Yes. What Good causes question. it really? Okay. Thank you. Um, your question was about restless leg syndrome, which is a great question because it is something that affects us during sleep, not affects some people, let's say, during sleep. Sometimes there is, a, they have found that there's a significant, again, correlation between restless leg syndrome and the deficiency of certain vitamins or certain compounds. For example, low vitamin D levels, there has been found a correlation or association between restless leg syndrome and low vitamin D. Low iron levels, they found that there's a correlation between low iron and uh, restless leg syndrome as well. And low magnesium levels, they found that there's a connection between those two. So possibly it could have to do with deficiencies. Not always, but that's one of the possibilities. So if that's something that you experience, then you might check those levels and make sure that they're all normal. And if they aren't, then, I mean, see a healthcare provider and ask for advice, okay, how much should I take and how do I elevate these levels and see if it improves. The other thing is I have had patients with restless leg syndrome, and I've advised them to do all the sleep things that we just talked about, and definitely to not exercise even later in the day, like to become a morning exerciser, and then to use that rub down that I just mentioned, like that massage combination of the castor oil, essential oil, rub your legs down because you want your muscles to be really well and relaxed, with the lavender essential oil, the castor oil is an anti-inflammatory, and that's been very effective, but I have found, even in my own practice, that some of those deficiencies have been present with my RLS uh, patients. I wanna thank everyone for your incredible questions. Let's end with a prayer, and then the next thing that we'll do is we'll go out and have our blood pressure taken. So let us pray. All right, let's stand and we'll have a closing prayer. Eternal God, we are so grateful for um, truth and grateful that you've blessed your people with truth and thank you that your word reminds us to rest. And God, we're also grateful for the Sabbath rest that is coming upon us and this is the greatest rest our body can receive spiritually. And I thank you for Dr. Nadine and the information that she shared. Father, may your Holy Spirit just really speak to us. Show us the errors of our ways. Help us, God. Your, our body is your temple. We need to treat it right, Father. We need to fall in line with this incredible design that you've created. And so I pray that you'll speak to each of our hearts, that we would truly find the physical rest we need, and also truly enter into this spiritual rest as we come into the Sabbath. Be with each of us now, Father, and um, as we do our blood pressure checks and then go home, may, we truly, may you truly grant 
your beloved sleep. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.